uh, will include isolationism, neutrality, and appeasement, okay, and the fifth column as well. Uh, so just leave those up there. And, uh, you know, we were talking about um, what on the last slide I brought up, what did I bring up? Let's go back. Oh, yeah, we were talking about that. Yeah, we talked about isolationism, where the American people are. And we'll, we'll go a little bit further, deeper into that as well uh, today. But one of the fears that the U.S. government has as China continues to expand southward, excuse me, Japan continues to expand southward, is that the Philippines are right here, guys. And from the Spanish-American War, 18, 1898-1899, Spanish-American War, and then we had to put down the Philippine insurrection because, you know, we freed the Philippines from the Spanish, and then we decided we would take over. So we had to put down what was called the Philippine insurrection. So by 1903, the United States has made the Philippines a territory like Guam, like the U.S. Virgin Islands, like Puerto Rico, okay? And so you guys, we have a lot of Americans, both military and civilian, living and working in the Philippines. And if we get attacked, Japanese attack the Philippines, you know what that means? We're probably going to have to go to war. Follow me? So Congress in 1934 passes the Tidings McDuffie Act and says to the Philippines, or to the world, to the Japanese, everybody, that we are going to be leaving the Philippines in 12 years, 1946, which we do in 1946. But the message is to the Japanese, what? Yeah, wait. We're not ready for war, okay? Which could be construed as a form of yeah. All right. Talked about neutrality. Neutrality is meant to keep us out of war, keep us from taking sides. So these neutrality acts are going to evolve over time. Okay, throughout the 1930s. So when we look at 1934-35, you see the U.S. is prevented from selling arms to nations at war. This keeps us out of it. Our guns aren't being used by either side. Keeps us neutral. Yes. This includes Spain, who's in the fight for her life against the fascists. Okay? These laws, these laws also prevent Americans, as I talked about yesterday, from going overseas and fighting on behalf of those fighting fascists. <clears throat> yes? Okay. Are we good there? Now, this, guys, is the furthest expansion of the Japanese Empire going into or throughout the war. Okay, so that slide is a little bit post-dated here. Because they don't control all of this yet. Okay, they'll attack here on December 7th, 1941. They will take all of this. Okay, they will take this. All right. Good? Okay. All right. So, by 1937... Our neutrality acts begin to shift somewhat. We will be able to make some sales to belligerent nations, nations that are at war or tend to be called belligerent nations. Okay, it's a term really used a lot in World War One. Okay, but this is a cash and carry basis. So if the British, the French, the Poles, anybody else wants to come buy our supplies, our weapons. They can, but they got to bring their ships into our ports, load them up themselves, pay cash, and carry them away. The catch is, we'll sell you guns, we'll sell you planes, we'll sell you artillery, but we won't sell you the bombs, the bullets, the shells for those weapons. Because guys, guns don't kill people, bullets kill people. And so this would keep us neutral because it wasn't American bombs and bullets being used, just the guns. I know, kind of makes you 
Yeah, so isolation, okay, will help our friends, but not too much. This will keep us out of the war. Okay. Now, Ken, I'm going to show you a video, okay? It's going to work if I click on this. I found this actually yesterday. Nope, something went wrong with this. You got to hit enter when you put this in here. Now it'll work. That face that is usually covered. It's actually a bit disturbing, and, and let me explain why. I don't know how you guys like view the world like from your 17, 18 year old perspective, okay? But as a history teacher, you know, I fly this flag, I don't know if you ever noticed the Union Jack being in here, okay? Guys, this is our closest ally in the world today and has been, well, the last time we fought against the British was the War of 1812. Yeah. <laughs> so they've kind of been by our side every step of the way. You understand? Like when, when we went to Iraq in 2003, France didn't go. Germany didn't go. Those are our allies. But the British went. They didn't have to, but they did because they're our friend and we stick together. Okay. This video is really from 1939, 1940. So by this time, not only has Poland been conquered, France has been conquered, and Britain has their backs to the wall. Okay. And yesterday I mentioned how there was an American Nazi party in the United States. And I also mentioned the American First Committee. And I mentioned Charles Lindbergh. Okay, and that's what this short video focuses on. And it's, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, for me it's a little frightening, but let's watch. And her hundreds attend a rally. Tonight's speaker is a famed aviator and American hero, Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh is a Nazi sympathizer, an avid opponent of U.S. involvement in the overseas conflict. France has now been defeated, and despite the propaganda and confusion of recent months, it is now obvious that England <laughs> is losing <laughs> war. I believe. <laughs> Is to abandon America's friend and ally. And I have been forced to the conclusion that we cannot win this war for England regardless of how much assistance we send. That is why the America First Committee has been formed. Lindbergh and the National America First Committee rail against any involvement in the war. There are hundreds of thousands of citizens agree. Since the war began in 1939, Americans have seen and heard about the devastation in Europe. Adolf Hitler's all-out attack on Poland makes the long-dreaded European war uncertain. But many are convinced that stopping Adolf Hitler is not worth the sacrifice of American lives. This time America should keep up, and I know I will. I'm sorry, God, dear. You're up in the I think we should stay out of it entirely. I don't want our efforts to be made to keep out of the fight, but you don't fight our own battle. They mean nothing to us. Some Americans publicly admire the Nazis and envision a fascist America. In February 1939, some 20,000 American Nazis rally in Madison Square Garden. This is what virtual care with doctors. <laughs> I don't know how you guys feel about that, but to me, it's a little, you know, it's a little frightening. Um, and this is where, like, Lindbergh, his reputation, who was, you know, one of the most famous international heroes, you know, of, of, the, of the early part of the century, um, his reputation will wane. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys. Uh, the ambassador to, to Great Britain during this time period was Joe Kennedy. 
uh, this is the patriarch of the, of the Kennedy family, the father of JFK. Um, and, you know, they, we had to pull him because uh, Britain, you know, they're like, get this freaking dude out of here because he doesn't support us. He's the ambassador to Britain from the United States. Okay, so they had to recall him, put somebody else in there. Okay. Um, so, guys, uh, by this time, um, isolationists are pushing for a constitutional amendment. Okay, that would require. Yeah. Sorry, was Joe Kennedy? He actually was not. Were they just afraid that he was against Britain, or was he actually? Oh yeah, he was. Yeah, he did not support the U.S. involvement in helping Britain against Germany. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's for real. Um, now his sons, two of them would fight in the war. Yeah, but they hadn't attacked us yet. Yeah. Was Great Britain actively being involved? Um, well, in the Battle of France, there will be British troops. Okay. And, um, yes. And then as soon as they take France, they will focus their attention on Britain. And that's in the summer of 1940. Um, France will fall in 39, early 40. So when is the war? The, dark, the war is going to start today. On... September 1st, 1939. But we got to get there. Okay. All right. So a constitutional amendment that would, um, in order for us to declare war. Okay. Because if we're going to send our sons, our daughters, our fathers, our brothers, sisters overseas to fight, this should be a decision made by the American people, right? I mean, we live in a democracy, yes? So it should be the American people to decide whether we're going to go to war. Right? Caleb, if I gave you a blank map and told you to point out the Ukraine, where the Ukraine is. Very good. What do you know about the Ukraine? <laughs> okay, what's going on with the Ukraine right now? Okay, Daryl, you can't play. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about everybody else that doesn't pay attention to this thing. No, it's a compliment. Okay, so listen. Most Americans don't have time or the will to pay attention to world events. They don't focus on it. Most Americans didn't pay attention in history class either. Now, you are not most Americans, okay? <laughs> so, listen, why would we put that decision in the hands of a group of people that are uninformed? I saw a lot of you guys agreeing with me, and I, I suckered you in pretty good. Okay, this is a horrible idea to make this a popular vote. Okay, because if, look, the reason why we have representative government, guys, is so we don't have mob rule. We don't have mob think. You understand? Because mobs tend to act irrationally. And that's why we elect people to make these decisions for us. Now, have those people screwed up before? Yes, they have. And we have to learn from that, and so do they. Okay? And that's why it's important who we elect and what they stand for. And we pay attention to what comes out of their mouth, not how it looks coming out of their mouth. Yes? So, 75% of the American people wanted this amendment in 1937. That's how isolationist we are. Okay? If I haven't proved it yet. All right. Roosevelt strongly opposes this, and so does Congress. They're not going to even propose it as an amendment. Okay. It's a silly idea. Okay, and, the, and, and then this next line is going to be confusing to you, I think. When Roosevelt proposes a world conference, to get the world together, 
to reduce arms and promote economic security. Now, if you're France or Poland right now, do you want to hear the president of the United States saying, hey, guys, let's come together, get rid of our weapons, commit suicide, so Hitler can just take over Europe? Because that's what he's asking countries to do, is give up their arms at a time when they need self-defense. Why is Roosevelt saying this? Yeah, he's a politician. This is what these people want to hear. Does he truly mean it? Probably not. Roosevelt's not stupid. Guys, we are rearming as well, okay? By 1934, we're really 35, we start to ramp up production of aircraft, military aircraft, and so forth, which I will go through with you guys. Of course, we gotta know the whole story, right? So yeah, this is kind of silly, okay? Um, British Prime Minister at the time is a guy named Neville Chamberlain, okay? And this is a guy, pretty famous person in 20th century history, Chamberlain, okay? So you can expect to see him on the test, okay? He gives a resounding no to Roosevelt. We're not doing this, okay? To his credit, okay? And this will be the last time I give Neville Chamberlain any credit, okay? As we will see on future slides. So this is where we're at. We're trying to stay out of this. The American people don't want to get involved, and we're going to be drug kicking and screaming into this war. We're going to sit it out. While our best friends in the world are either overrun or being, you know, assaulted greatly as Britain will be. Okay. Good? Hitler on the march. Here we go. Where's Hitler from? Okay. Now, the excuse, and these are the three countries that we're going to talk about today, and we may not get to Poland today. We'll see. Um, but Austria and Czechoslovakia and Poland, there are people of German ancestry living in these countries. And Hitler's going to use uniting German blood, bringing these Germans back into the fold as an excuse or as a reason for invading these countries. Okay? Justification, if you will. Okay? So he's going to amass his army at the border with Austria. Now, guys, the fifth column in Austria is very strong. Of course, it's Hitler's home country. He has tried to build up good relationships with people inside of Austria, use propaganda against the Austrian government, and so forth. Now, this is where I like to bring up a movie that I believe many of you have probably seen. <laughs> no, we're not there yet. <laughs> yes. The Sound of Music. Raise your hand if you've seen The Sound of Music. <laughs> I know half of the songs. <laughs> Avril, what's wrong with you? Go! Yes, Mary Poppins. Ju uh, yeah, Julie Andrews. Okay. If you remember from the movie, um, Liesel's the oldest daughter. This is the Von Tropp family, right? And the father, he's like an admiral in the Navy, yes? Okay, does he like the Nazis? No, he doesn't like the Nazis, okay? But the oldest daughter, Liesel, who I believe her name was, had herself a little boyfriend named Rolf. 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 And Rolf was infatuated with who? Hitler and the Nazis. Okay, he was wearing, I think in the movie he wears like an armband, right? 
she actually dress up like <coughs> a brown shirt? At one point, he's in the army. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's a little bit late. Yeah. yeah. So you can see how, you know, the influence of the Nazis in Austria, okay? And so the Austrians don't have the military might to, to fight the Germans, okay? So they won't. So as the German army goose steps into Austrian soil, they will be met with Nazi flags waving, okay? This is all pre, oh, it's all set up. It's all orchestrated by Hitler, okay? So you look at this picture, and this picture can be found in most history books on World War II. You see this woman crying. These look like tears of pain, sorrow, that they're going to be living under Nazi Germany. What the caption reads, guys, these are tears of joy. These are not tears of pain and sorrow. Okay? They have been brainwashed, many in Austria have, into, you know, really thinking this was the right thing for Austria. Okay? And so Hitler will take over Austria, annex it, make it part of Germany. Okay? When we talk about annexation, um, I like to tell this story, and I don't know if you guys, you, you've all driven through Eastboro on the way to the East Mall, where it's 20 miles an hour. Yeah, and the so, high. And <laughs> so back in the 1950s, when Wichita was expanding, it attempted to annex and make Eastboro part of Wichita. But the mayor of Eastboro and the mayor of Wichita did not get along. And so Eastboro refused to be annexed. And so Wichita grew around it. So they have, you know, they have their own police force. Um, they use Central County firefighters instead of Wichita firefighters, okay? Because of that, for that reason. They're part of the county, not part of Wichita, okay? So they're their own little government there, okay? But that's what it means to annex. It means to envelop and make part of, okay? So he's got one country down without having to fire a shot. Now, there will be a huge celebration in Hitler's hometown of Brunei, where hundreds of thousands of people will come out for the celebration of uniting Austria with Germany. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me, let me show you something that really makes me upset. And I hope YouTube is watching this right now, because I'm filming and I'm going to put this on your platform. This is a video of the annexation of Poland, or excuse me, of Austria by the Germans. But YouTube has chosen to take this down. Of course there's hate speech in it. It's the freaking Nazis, okay? And so they take this video down so we can't see history take place in 1939. Hi. Yeah, say like with India. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying this is censorship. I'm just saying, if you want to scroll, you see the video. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to make a point, Daryl. <laughs> there, there are technological workarounds. I understand. Now I can't put it on YouTube. Let's we'll see what happens. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> trying to teach history here so my, my children. My students do not become anti-Semitic, okay, and um, they don't become neo-Nazis. Okay, you don't okay. want to say you stuff like that, otherwise you'll get taken down for hate speech. Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, okay, it's probably going to get swatted by YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably go through all my videos. Yeah, then I'm really in trouble, and then they're going to report it to the news. And I'm going to lose my job. E Brett's going to be on the news. You know what? I don't care. You mean <laughs> Okay. So, do you guys remember when I talked about the Sudetenland? 
Okay, so I'm going to draw a rough Czechoslovakia here, okay? And then Germany's, you know, here, right? So this region of Germany, or of Czechoslovakia, is called the Sudetenland, okay? Here. And there are mountain ranges here. The Alps, okay? Three million people of German ancestry living in the Sudetenland. Also, what you will find in the Sudetenland is what's called the Skoda Works. Skoda Works are the second largest munition factories in Europe. The largest munition, munition factory in Europe now is in Germany. The second largest is in Czechoslovakia. Okay? So once Hitler is able to take the Sudetenland, he will be able to rearm even more. Follow me? So, the Czechs... They want to fight. They're willing to fight. They have the defensive barrier of the Alps, the Alps, to fight. And they're expecting help because they're the only dem democratic nation east of the Rhine River at this point. So you think the other democracies in Europe might say, hey, let's help the Czechs. And then you may even think... <laughs> That the Russians, remember when I talked about how when anything happens in southeastern Europe, it raises the ire of the Russians because they don't have a warm water port in the wintertime? So maybe the Russians will help. So the Czech government calls on European powers to help. And so Chamberlain of Britain, Dalibier of France, okay, who's the French premier, are going to call for a meeting with Hitler and Mussolini. Here we go. Now, where are they going to hold this meeting? On German soil. <laughs> it's called a home field advantage. Yes? Now, at this meeting, they're discussing the fate of Czechoslovakia. Who is not in the room? The president of Czechoslovakia is in the hallway. Because he's not allowed in the meeting. Because Hitler said he's not coming in. Because we're discussing them, and it's between us. That's what happens when you have meetings on the German family. This is why you don't. He sets the rules for the meeting. This is why you meet our everyone's affairs. When the Czech president realizes what they're doing in there, he begins to weep for his country. Because what the French and the British, Chamberlain and Dalidera, are going to do is carve up Czechoslovakia and hand the Sudetenland over to Adolf Hitler. This becomes known as the Munich Pact. Chamberlain returns to London, exits the aircraft, on the tarmac, reporters and other supporters have come to hear the news of what took place in Munich. Chamberlain holds up a piece of paper. He said, this piece of paper, which bears my name, where, as well as the signature of Hitler, that he will seek no new terror territorial gains in Europe. We have peace in our time. And the crowd erupts in applause. And the headlines in every newspaper in Europe quote Chamberlain, peace in our time. Now that the Alps are gone and Germany's able to move her army into the Sudetenland, the Czechs will not be able to put up a defense. 
if the Germans attack? How long do you think it'll take? Not very long. One year. One year. Six months later, after peace in our times, the Germans will invade Czechoslovakia. And the Czechs will not fight because they know they can't win. So now Hitler has taken over two nations without firing a shot. Guys, this is the single greatest example of appeasement leading up to World War II. To carve up a nation and hand it over to your enemy to avoid war. I have a video. Yeah. Like fleeing? Yeah. Yeah. They, oh, yeah? Yeah. From Czech? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you know about, about this Munich fact? Uh, I knew that they ended up right before World War. Yeah. 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 Many Austrians fled. Many Czechs fled. Um, in the movie Casablanca, um, which is in Morocco, um, that became like a hub. It's on the Atlantic coast uh, for people trying to escape the war. Um, and so that kind of becomes the setting for the movie uh, Casablanca. So like people, people with, that have the means to get out, go try and go through Casablanca. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my great... Yeah, my great German, my great German. Okay. Cool. Who knew we had so many checks? Because I have what's her name in uh, second out. Hans. Uh, you got the weird last name. Oh, yeah. Hannah. Yeah. You too. Yeah. Got some check. Yeah, so that's March of 1939, okay? Now I'm going to bring this guy up again. <laughs> YouTube hasn't taken this one down yet. A big power intimidates its neighbors. Give us A crisis erupts. World leaders meet to head off war. A deal is struck and peace is proclaimed. But rather than deterring aggression, the deal inadvertently promotes it. Within a year, the world is at war. Why are you doing that? I'm Jim yeah. Lindsay, and this is History Lesson. Our topic today is the Munich Agreement, which was signed by the leaders of Germany, Italy, Britain, and France in the early morning hours of September 30th, 1938. The backdrop to the Munich Agreement is Adolf Hitler's rise to power and Germany's remilitarization. Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany in 1933. A year later, he made himself a dictator or Fuhrer and ushered in the Third Reich. Hitler moved aggressively to jumpstart a foundering German economy and to jettison the constraints that had been imposed on the German military after World War I. European leaders nervously looked the other way as he ran rush on over the security provisions of the Treaty of Versailles and reasserted German power in Central Europe. One goal of Hitler's policies was to create Lebensraum, or greater living space for Germans. The belief that Germany needed expanded borders included the idea that ethnic Germans living in neighboring countries should come under German rule. In March 1938, Germany absorbed Austria in the Anschluss. Hitler then turned his attention to the Sudetenland, those parts of Czechoslovakia where some three million ethnic Germans predominate. Hitler grew increasingly hostile to Czechoslovakia over the course of the summer of 1938. In mid-September, he gave a fiery anti-Czech speech raising fears that war was imminent. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain responded by rushing to Germany for talks to keep the continent at peace. Chamberlain approached his talk with Hitler, mindful of how the First World War had laid ways to a generation of Europeans, and worried that new technologies like the airplane would make the next war even more horrific. He also worried that the British military was ill prepared to fight Germany, and that the British public wanted peace, not war. So without consulting Czechoslovakian leaders, Chamberlain agreed to Hitler's demand that Germany absorb the Sudetenland. Chamberlain then persuaded the Czechoslovakian and French governments to accept his concession. The details were worked out in two subsequent sets of meetings. 
The Czechoslovakian government was pointedly not invited to the concluding talks at Munich that finalized the country's dismemberment. On October 1, 1938, Czechoslovakian frontier guards left their posts and German troops moved into the Sudetenland. The day before, Chamberlain had flown back to London where he was met by cheering crowds. He waved a memo Hitler had signed pledging Germany's peaceful intentions and told the crowd that he had brought peace for our time. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Some of you perhaps have already heard what it contains. I would just like to read it to you. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Not all of Chamberlain's fellow Britons believe that he had saved the day. Winston Churchill's response to what Chamberlain had brought at Munich was withering. You were given the choice between war and dishonor. You chose dishonor, and you will have war. As we all know, Churchill was right. Eleven months after the Munich Agreement was signed to Cheers, German troops invaded Poland. The Second World War had begun. The terms Munich and appeasement entered the diplomatic hall of shame. What is the lesson of the Munich Agreement? Just this, appeasing an adversary's demands may diffuse a crisis, but it can also increase the chances of war by emboldening that adversary to demand more. Chamberlain thought that if Germany gained the Sudetenland, that Hitler would finally be satisfied with the status quo in Europe. But Hitler instead viewed Munich as confirming his belief that Britain and France both lacked the will to stop German expansion. It is worth remembering the Munich Agreement as we survey potential threats around the globe today. China is a growing military power that is challenging the He kind of rehashes what he talked about in that other video I uh, watched the other day. Um, yeah, so. That looks all right. Okay, yeah, uh, and again, guys, this was uh, something we didn't know at the time, but if Britain and France would have stood up and backed Czechoslovakia, um, that German generals were ready, you know, ready to remove it, to get rid of it, okay, and, um, but Hitler's just handed this stuff, okay, and so he is emboldened, for sure, okay, uh, that these other democracies are not ready to fight, okay? And we're gonna throw a little more fuel on the fire here, okay? As we look at this, um, Roosevelt's response, okay, to this. Good? No? Yeah, so let's just talk about Churchill for a second. Um, Churchill started his career as a young man as a journalist. I don't know if you guys remember studying something called the Boer War in, in, in Africa. Um, he was a journalist covering that and got captured. And as he tells it, made this miraculous escape. Okay. And then he goes on to become the um, Secretary of Navy uh, for Britain. And have you heard of Gallipoli, okay, which is a disaster for the British? And you can kind of blame Churchill for it, okay, if, if you study it. Um, then, he, then he joins Parliament. He was Chancellor of the Exchequer as well. Uh, joins Parliament, and he's on the left. So in Britain, in their Parliament, they have left and right, too. Sometimes you call it Labour on the left, uh, Conservatives or Tories on the right, this sort of thing, yes. And um, so he's, he's, in the, he's on the left. But nobody in the party likes him. So he's what's called a backbencher that sits in the back. But you can still, still hear him back there because he's very loud and very opinionated. And then he switches parties and goes over to the right. 
Okay, and nobody in the right party likes him either. So he's a backbencher over there. But guys, from 1933 forward, Churchill was always the loudest voice warning people about Hitler and what he planned to do. You know why? Because Churchill read his book. <laughs> and people just wanted to, you know, pull the covers over there. They wanted to ignore this, what was happening. And Churchill was the, always the one yelling about it. And so when the crap hit the fan, as it will here, they looked to Churchill to lead them during the war, which is a great decision by the British people by the British party, okay, as we will see. He has his faults, okay, as all men do. So this map kind of shows you what happens to Czechoslovakia carved up. There were subsequent meetings here, but there's the Sudetenland, okay, and then this is Czech territory ceded to Hungary. Thanks. Yeah. And then um, over here, the Poles, they are going to annex this out of fear because this is before Germany takes the rest of Czechoslovakia and they're like, hey, we need to take this and arm it for our own defense. The Poles do that. Okay. So you can see it's carved up. We've got a couple of political cartoons here. Uh, of course, this is Dr. Seuss. Okay. And on this platform, the most amazing marvel of the age. He lives, he talks, yet he has no guts. Is the appeaser. Modern political cartoon. This is from 2004, War on Terror. That this rabid wolf like creature here. And you give him a bone. You see, I give Doggy a bone. He goes away, okay? So be nice to the, the enemy and They'll leave you alone, right? Another Dr. Seuss. Am I allowed to talk about Dr. Seuss or has he been canceled? Oh, he's been canceled. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I need to take these out of my notes. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, one of his books. Yeah. There's also some I got an idea. Let's burn books. Yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah. 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 You guys bring bring all your books that uh, you know offend people and we'll burn books. Are we living in 1984? Okay. You got this creepy Nazi octopus creature play him a nice song, he won't bite your head off. Okay. There's only six tentacles. Um octopus. Who has That's six? Something weird. Is that a spider? Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Uh, this is actually portraying a CNN international correspondent. Her name is Christiane Amanpour. I actually have a lot of respect for her. Um, I mean, I don't like her politics, but she uh, she's a brave reporter. She puts herself in some uh, pretty hairy situations to report international events and has for a couple of decades. But if uh, we were liberating France in, on June 6, 1944, the news may spin it this way. By invading here at Normandy, the Allies are collectively punishing the French for the Nazi occupation of their country. Uh, and then I know everybody has a different opinion on this, which we'll talk about later. U.S. overreacts. The president ignores pleas for proportional response to Pearl Harbor. All right. This will be the last slide I think we do. How much time do we have? Seven? Okay. All right, so April 7th, 1939, Italy's back at it. Okay, and I know you can all pick out Albania on a map. Mm -hmm. Right? Definitely. It's uh, just across the heel of the boot of Italy, okay, right there, okay. And so Italy is going to invade Albania. Okay. <laughs> My, my, the church that I attend, um, 
right now. We're trying to seed um, some churches in Macedonia and Albania right now, which is really underserved uh, for Christians. There. So we've got quite a few missionaries over there right now. Can you tell us just how the Civil War is um, Well, there was a Civil War in all of this area in the 90s, uh, but mostly in Serbia, Kosovo, um, where they were, the Christians were trying to ethnically cleanse their nation of uh, Muslims. Um, it was horrible. War crimes. It was genocide. Um, and we helped stop it. Okay. We, you know, we did not put soldiers in country, but from the air. Um, there was a guy named Slobodan Milosevic, who was the head of the Serbian Christians. And um, he's a war criminal. Um, we basically, from the air, destroyed his ability to make war against his neighbors. Uh, and now we have peacekeepers there today. Trying to, because the, the, the Muslims that live in Kosovo have not forgotten what happened to their families. So, I don't know if I've talked about ethnic cleansing in here. Have I? Are you separate the men and the women? kill the men, and you, uh, you rape the women, and they have your children, and you kind of wipe that ethnicity out. Yeah, that's scary that that was happening in the 1990s in, in Europe. So, we did get involved. That was with President Clinton. Okay, uh, so, Britain steps up. Chamberlain says this, all right, you lied to me, Hitler, okay? If... If Poland, Greece, or Romania are attacked, we are going to go to war. Okay. Now, does Britain start sending troops into these countries to help defend them? No, they do not. Okay. And you guys know what's coming. It's going to be Poland, right? Uh, then Roosevelt sends this letter to Hitler. Read it. What is Roosevelt doing? Hitler gets this letter from the President of the United States. He's like, oh, the United States, they're not ready for war. They don't want war. Oh, they're asking us not to uh, attack these countries. So he reads this letter, Hitler does, in front of the German Reichstag, which is full of a bunch of Nazi stooges, okay? And he starts m mocking the President. It's like, we want no Poles. We want no Swedes. We want no Finns. No. He goes through this list of countries. He's mocking the president. So that this, this gets back to Roosevelt that he does this. Okay? And Roosevelt's pissed. So he goes to Congress and says, hey, Congress, let's start sending weapons now to our friends and munitions now. What does Congress say? No, there's an election coming up. <laughs> Congress wants to get reelected. They don't want to be seen as warmongers. It's a mess, okay? Let's just check in on Japan one last time. <laughs> okay. Again. Now, the Japanese are behaving badly. They are killing a whole bunch of Chinese people. They are expanding their scope. And so Congress passes a law that says we can stop trading with Japan if we want. We don't stop trading with Japan yet. Okay? This does free Congress to stop the sale of war materials. And guys, when you talk about war materials, it could be anything from iron ore, could be rubber, steel, or fuel. Guys, during this time period, we are one of the largest exporters of oil to Japan. And as you know, the Japanese Army and the Japanese Navy need fuel to function. Okay. 
They had also been buying our weapons. <laughs> Cash and carry. Crazy. Now there will come a day when we will stop trading with Japan. That day is in 1940. Um, late 1940. And that'll be kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. So to speak. With, with Japan. We're on slide 17. And I'm saving that for tomorrow. Okay. Good. And uh, we'll start for war tomorrow, too.